class via Zoom on the Crested Butte area, Crested Butte and the surrounding area. So we'd like to have you tune in if you are interested. So here we go on the monarch country. I always like to start off by saying it is a stunningly beautiful high country in Colorado in the Rocky Mountains, but it's one of the least known. And yet some of the most exciting railroad mining and skiing history took place in the monarch country, both in Colorado and the West. The region was also very important to the industrial revolution, which was going on in Colorado at the time. The Monarch country is bordered to the east by the majestic Sawatch mountain range, 15 mountains, 14,000 feet or better, highlighted by Chavano and Tabawatch nearby, and to the west, 11,312 foot high Monarch Pass and Colorado's western slope. The South Arkansas River heads near Monarch Pass and runs straight through the Monarch country before entering the fast flowing Arkansas River near the town of Salida. Monarch country history goes all the way back to 1779 that we know about when the Spanish governor of Santa Fe, Juan Baptiste de Anza, crossed Pancha Pass on the trail of Comanche Indians led by the, their great warrior chief Cuerno Verde. And you got a good look at Salida right now on June the 1st, 1895, about 125 years ago. Zebulon Pike exploring the Southern region of the Louisiana Purchase Territory in December of 1806, camped a few miles north of Salida on Christmas day and his starving men feasted on buffalo meat. Perhaps most important, however, in the opening of the Monarch country was the discovery of gold 50 miles to the north at California Gulch, soon to become known as Leadville. In the late 1870s, Leadville was one of the great mining towns of the American West with 30,000 people living there, the number one populated town in the state. It desperately needed a railroad. And on July the 23rd, 1880, William Jackson Palmer's narrow gauge Denver and Rio Grande Railroad arrived, having come via Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, the Royal Gorge, the Arkansas River, and then up the Arkansas River to the booming mining camp. One of the first towns that it came into was a town that was initially known as South Arkansas City, but soon was named Salida, which means exit in Spanish. And that town began in 1880 when the Rio Grande began to head north towards Leadville. It was always a railroad town with two railroad roundhouses, one for narrow gauge and the other for standard gauge. Today, Salida is a town of about 5,000. It's the county seat of Chafee County, which includes the largest number of 14,000 foot high mountains in North America. The Continental Divide goes through it and 77% of the county is federal land. Salida, interestingly enough, also had a smelter which produced lead and zinc during World War II. And that smelter had a smokestack 365 feet high to mitigate pollution. Today, it is still there and on the National Register of Historic Places. A little settlement began in 1876, four years before Salida on the South Arkansas River because of its location. The little town was called Poncha Springs, and before the railroad came, was on Alto Mears Toll Road, which ran from Sawatch near the San Luis Valley to California Gulch, crossing nearby Poncha Pass to get there. Poncha Springs, and you can see the springs there way back in the early days. Poncha Springs grew to 500 people and was the first town of the Monarch country, complete with a bank, post office, store, school, and church. Even before Poncha Springs began, Ute Indians and mountain men used the hot springs that were right there for many years to recover from wounds and injuries. By the early 1880s, Poncha Springs had become an important railroad center. The Denver and Rio Grande passed through heading north to Leadville, and the main line was built in 1881 over Marshall Pass west into the Gunnison country. In addition, the Rio Grande also built from Poncha Springs up the South Arkansas River and into the booming camp of Monarch, a great silver camp and also a limestone quarry which was right nearby. 
By 1881, when the Rio Grande built its road to Maysville, six miles to the west, Poncha Springs changed from a boom town. The local paper declared, it relieved the town of the disturbing elements and it became the most quiet and delightful of Southern summer resorts. And now you're gonna take a look at the town we're gonna to go to next and that's the great town of Maysville. That's where the Monarch Pass toll road was. The Monarch country now began to open. And in 1881, a local newspaper gave the description of its growth and I'm quoting, from the new town of South Arkansas or Salida to Monarch Pass, which is located at the head of the South Arkansas River, it is 22 miles. The traveler in going there visits first the town of Poncha Springs, five miles, thence to Maysville, it is six miles, then to Arbor Villa, four miles, then to Junction City, three miles, thence to Monarch, about a mile. From this lively camp to the summit of the pass, it is three miles. The next town up the South Arkansas River was Maysville, what you're looking at right now. It was named for the hometown in Kentucky of William Marshall, the surveyor who discovered nearby Marshall Pass. It was six miles west of Poncha Springs, began in 1879 with the original name of Crazy Camp because of its great red light district. The camp was wide open with a lot of gambling, saloons and prostitution with ladies of the evening with names like Diamond Tooth Leona and Cat Futch and Hambone Jane. It was on the Monarch Toll Road that ran, to Poncha, ran from Poncha Springs to the mining camp of Monarch. And when the Denver and Rio Grande built through it in 1881, the population soared to a thousand. Maysville was laid out in a beautiful park and soon had a post office, bank, two hotels, five stores, six saloons, four dance halls and two May uh, newspapers, the Maysville Chronicle and the South Arkansas Miner. The toll gate on the Monarch Toll Road was at Maysville, allowing travelers to go up to Monarch and also allowing one to go on to the Altman Toll Road, which ran to the mining and railroad camp of Hancock to nearby Chalk Creek. And the gate also allowed travelers to go on another toll road out of Maysville this one leading to another nearby mining camp called Chavano. The silver panic of 1893, which dropped the price of silver to 58 cents an ounce, caused miners to leave the South Arkansas country and Maysville faded, a shadow of its former self. In 2021 today, the award-winning Mountain Spirits Winery is there and the old schoolhouse built in 1882 and closed in 1939 has been restored and still stands. And a sidelight, Justin Timberlake and his wife, Jessica Beal have a home in Maysville. Beal's mother grew up in Salida. At Maysville, one goes by a yellow house once owned by Harry Miller, a miner and farmer who after retiring sat on his porch and waved to cars as they passed by on Highway 50. And that began a tradition that continues today. It is understood that you blow your car horn and wave as you pass by the house. It's considered bad luck not to do so. After his retirement, Harry raised 10 acres of strawberries in back of the house. One of his friends was a radio personality named Fibber McGee from the radio program, Fibber McGee and Molly. And he often visited and stayed with a close friend in Maysville. Four miles west of Maysville and 15 miles from Salida was a town called Arbor Villa. The little camp began in 1879. It was named for an early pioneer named Pap Arbor. It had a smelter, 500 people and a three-story building that stood along the Monarch Toll Road. Later on, that building, the stage stop, became a parlor house and brothel where prostitutes with names like Fifi LaRue and Slanting Annie and Timberline Kate plied their trade. Arbor Villa became well-known because of Frank Gimlet, who was known as the Hermit of Arbor Villa. 
Gimlet wrote a series of short publications called Trails of Yesteryear, praising mining and acting as a booster for the South Arkansas region. And there he is on the left, and that is the governor of Colorado, Ralph Carr, and this picture was taken in the 1940s. Gimlet wrote letters to the governor of Colorado trying to get two nearby peaks, Chavano and Tabawatch, renamed for his favorite actress, Ginger Rogers, who it was said, did everything that her partner, the great dancer Fred Astaire did, and did it backwards and in high heels. Gimlet later in life could be seen on top of Monarch Pass, selling artifacts and regaling tourists with stories of yesteryear. Three miles up the South Arkansas, Junction City began as a silver camp in 1880, and a thousand miners soon existed in the nearby hills. It was located at the junction of two roads, one going straight west over Monarch Pass and one going north over Alpine Pass and into the Gunnison country. When President James Garfield was assassinated in 1881, the miners of Junction City changed the name of the camp to Garfield to honor the dead president. And there it is in 1886. Garfield had two great mines high above the camp. They were Columbus and the Black Tiger, a 2,375 foot long aerial tram ran from the Columbus mine and went way down to a stamp mill at Garfield. Garfield soon had the Cummings Hotel, a post office, good mines, and the Denver and Rio Grande running through it. However, avalanches, fires, and the Panic of 1893 marked the downfall of that promising camp. On September the 11th, 1971, a Gunnison school bus carrying junior high, high school football players lost its brakes on top of Monarch Pass and roared out of control down the east side of the pass. Reaching a speed of an estimated 90 miles an hour, it crashed at Garfield, killing eight football players and one coach, one of the worst accidents in Colorado history. The crash led to all the safety measures one sees on school buses today. And I can tell you, every one of us in the Gunnison country, when September 11 comes, we not only think of the Twin Towers, but we think of that very sad day in 1971. That crash followed another bus incident that occurred 21 years earlier on November the 18th, 1950. On that day, a bus was carrying the Western State College football team to Canyon City for a game against Adams State College. On his descent off Monarch Pass, the bus suddenly lost its brakes and the gear shift popped into neutral. The driver fought to keep it on the road, yelling at the players to shift their weight to one side of the bus or another as it careened down the curves. The bus reached 100 miles an hour before leveling out at the base of the pass and coming to a stop. One of the football players was later interviewed on an early TV program and declared that he had thrown a dirty book he had been reading out the bus window so his mother would not know of it if he had been killed. One mile above Garfield was the great silver camp of Monarch. And there it is in the 1880s. William Harvey of Terry Haute, Indiana, who would later change his name to Nicholas P. Creed after losing his girlfriend to his brother and later becoming famous for founding the great silver town of Creed near the head of the Rio Grande, found the Monarch Mine there in 1878. Soon other silver mines were located in the area and the camp of Monarch grew up around them. The original name of the camp was Chafee City named after the great mining man, Jerome Chafee, but it was soon changed to Monarch after the leading mine of the area. Monarch sat at 10,028 feet and the Denver and Rio Grande narrow gauge from Salida dead ended there. It was a great early silver camp. At its peak in the 1880s, 2000 people lived there with 300 men working at the famed Madonna mine. An aerial tram carried ore from the Monarch mine way up above down to a smelter and the Denver and Rio Grande fire below. 
And there you get a great look at Monarch. And if you look in the center of the picture, you can see that aerial tram, which dropped 1,000 feet in elevation from the mine all the way down to the smelter and the mill below. That great silver camp had 125 houses, three stores, three saloons, three hotels, three assay offices, a post office, and a mining exchange. 20 mines surrounded the town, and these mines turned out $9 million of silver by 1901, and silver then sold at a dollar an ounce. By today's prices of silver, which is now up to about $19 an ounce, by today's prices, Monarch's mines would have turned out over $150 million worth of silver. The Silver Panic of 1893 killed Monarch. And after that, the camp was ravaged by roaring avalanches, including a major slide in 1907, which destroyed most of the camp and killed four people. Near Monarch, the Eclipse Limestone Quarry opened after the turn of the century, and the owners eventually sold out to the Colorado Fuel and Iron Company of Pueblo, which needed the lime in the making of steel at their mills. The CF&I ran that quarry until 1981, and then sold out in 96 to the U.S. Lime and Mineral Company out of Dallas, and still operating today. The limestone taken to Pueblo by rail was absolutely indispensable in the industrial revolution going on in the United States. Coking coal from the Crested Butte coal mines, lime from the Monarch Quarry, and molten iron from Trinidad came together in the steel mills of Pueblo. And there they came together in blast furnaces invented by Englishman Henry Besmer back in 1856. The blast furnace got rid of impurities in the iron, and the result was steel, which powered the United States Industrial Revolution. I grew up in Michigan's Upper Peninsula in the iron and copper country, where we got towns with names like Iron Wood and Iron River, and one town called Bessemer. Today, in 2021, the lime is used as a fire suppressant. It's used in fertilizer and asphalt, and in reclamation projects. In addition to being a great mining camp, Monarch was the end of track for the railroad. The Denver and Rio Grande narrow gauge branch line ran from Poncha Springs and Salida to Monarch from 1881 to 1956. And there you can see the train loaded with lime moving out of the quarries and heading down towards Salida. Until 1956, narrow gauge trains carried ore and limestone to Salida, where a barrel roller picked up the narrow gauge cars and turned them upside down with contents dumped into broad gauge cars, which then ran to Pueblo and the steel mills there. And there is the barrel roller, which picked up those narrow gauge cars, dumped them down into the broad gauge car, Three narrow gauge car filled up a broad gauge car, and then the road was broad gauged all the way to Pueblo. What a sight it was along the South Arkansas River. Little narrow gauge engines chugging uphill, pulling cars behind them, and gaining 3,000 feet in elevation in 19 miles from Salida to Monarch. Then on the return trip, loaded with silver ore and limestone, and heavy on the brakes, the train went downhill to the Salida rail yards. In 1956, the Rio Grande broad gauged the line from Monarch to Salida, ending the colorful narrow gauge era. The rails were pulled out from Salida to Monarch in 1983, ending a 102 year railroad era in the Monarch country. One of the most fantastic th things about Monarch Country is that there were three separate Monarch Passes. Old, old Monarch Pass was built in 1879, a very primitive dirt road, and lasted until 1921. The pass was over 11 and a half thousand feet high and ran into the Gunnison Country on the west slope, 
via the head of Tamichi Creek and then over Black Sage Pass, a little town called Doyleville and into Gunnison. Old, old Monarch Pass ran right through today's Monarch ski area along a run called Great Divide. However, it was only a primitive wagon road and it was replaced by a more modern road in 1921 called Old Monarch Pass. And that road operated from 1921 to 39. It was a little east of the present Monarch Pass. Old Monarch dropped into the Gunnison country via a different route, following pretty much today's highway into Sargent's and then following Tamichi Creek for 32 miles into Gunnison. The current Monarch Pass Road was built in 1939, and there it is in the 1940s on a snowbound road. And it was initially a dirt road. 11,312 feet. And very early it was called the Rainbow Route because of how it arched over the Continental Divide looking like a rainbow. It ran from the head of the South Arkansas River and down Agate Creek on the west side. There was a major controversy when it was being built over whether or not Marshall Pass at 10,856 feet where the railroad crossed or Monarch Pass should be used to cross the Continental Divide. Marshall Pass was 500 feet lower and the Denver and Rio Grande ran over it, but it also had a lot of switchbacks. Monarch, also called Agate Pass, was chosen by State Highway Commissioner Charlie Vail, who was very arrogant and thought he knew everything. He greatly angered local people when the new pass opened in 1939 by naming it Vail Pass after himself. And there you can see it. People look at that today and says, how can that possibly be Vail Pass with Salida 23 miles one way and Gunnison 42 in the other? But that's the way it looked in 1939 when Charlie Vail tried to name it after himself. Angry local people responded by throwing the Vail Pass sign on top of the pass into a ditch. And then they added an S to Vail and dropped the P on the pass to read Vail's ass. Charlie Vail finally gave up and the name Monarch was used as it had always been. Vail, however, was not through. He did get the pass between Copper Mountain Ski Area and Vail named for himself. Monarch Pass was not open in the winter until after World War II, and the pass usually closed around Thanksgiving and then opened up again around Memorial Day. Skiing had gone on both on Monarch and Marshall Passes for many years, before and after the turn of the century. And there you can see skiers in the 1920s skiing right where the limestone quarry was, not far from the town of Monarch. Local people from both Salida and Gunnison would take the train to the top of Marshall Pass and then ski down to the Chavano Switch. They would then, after many runs, catch a night train back for home. Locals from Salida also took the train to Monarch to the mining camp, got off, and then skied the nearby slopes for the rest of the day, as you can see them right there until the early evening train came to take them back to Salida. One of the great ski events in Colorado history occurred on February the 13th, 1938, when the Gunnison and Salida Ski Club sponsored a ski special. 157 skiers came from Gunnison by train, 408 from Salida, and another 122 on the regular train, and they all came to the top of Marshall Pass. And there you see it. There's the train on that February day right on top of the pass. And there people skied off the pass and tobogganed off the pass. Count Philip de Puy of Belgium, along with Thor Groswald of Winter Park, gave lessons as skiers and tobogganers skied or sledded down to the Chavano switch five miles down the west side of the pass. Horace France played polkas on his accordion and many danced. 
Willie the porter, the singing porter, entertained skiers with many songs. Music, skiing, dancing, tobogganing, food and drink came together on the pass that day. And many dreamed of a time when a ski area might exist on top of Marshall Pass. In 1939, one year later, the same year the new Monarch Pass was built, a new ski area did get started, but it came high up on the east side of Monarch Pass. The Monarch Ski Area began as a WPA New Deal project. It included a rope tow halfway up a run called the Gun Barrel and a 30 foot by 30 foot lodge called the Inferno after Salida Mayor Claude Ferno. And there it is. There is the first lodge. And there's another picture of the Inferno very early, this one in the 1950s. The ski area in the early days, there was no parking lot there. Skiers just parked on the side of Highway 50. There were no bathrooms. Skiers used the nearby trees. The ski area was owned by the town of Salida. And in the early years, it was only open on the weekends. By the winter of 1940 and 41, two rope toes existed. One ran halfway up the gun barrel and the other was a rope toe for beginners called Snowflake. When the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, bringing the U.S. into World War II, the Monarch ski area closed for the duration of the war, not opening again until January of 1947. In 1956, Salida, waiting to get rid of the financial burden of the ski area, sold it to Ray Barry, who had worked there for 10 years for $100. And there is Ray Barry, who bought that area from Salida for a hundred bucks in 1956. Three years later, the Barry family started the Monarch Winter Sports Area with hopes of expansion. Monarch was open every day of the week for the first time during the winter of 1961 and 62 and hosted 7,000 skiers. Now, Jim Palfance is on board out of Stockbridge, Mass, and he gave me this information. The Western State Ski Team came up to ski at Monarch because the Crested Butte Ski Area didn't open up until 61, 62, and it was kind of a jerry-rigged operation. The snow was a lot better at Monarch. So they had a cross-country course, and they skied on the gun barrel. And Jim told me they had a jump that they made on the gun barrel, but Sven Wick, the Olympic coach and the Western State ski coach, shut that down when one guy hurt his leg one day, broke a leg. But the Western State ski team was up there a lot. In Thanksgiving, Thanksgiving break 1962, yours truly went up with three of my students up to Monarch I'd never skied before. How I got down to the Garfield lift, I'll never know. As I rode up the lift, never having been on a lift before, I thought, well, when you get off the lift, they must drop you, you drop off the chair into a pile of snow. Little did I know. That day on a run that would take me about four minutes, took me three hours, because I'd go 50 yards and I would crash. And then you had long thongs and it, it was three hours. And I finally got into a ski class that was run by a band named Glenn Cress and I learned how to ski. Thank God, I never thought I'd be able to do it. In 1967, Ray Berry sold the ski area to an entrepreneur and character named Elmo Bevington for $132,000. Bevington was from Nebraska and owned two beer distributorships, a paint company, an egg ranch, an antique car business, a jewelry company, a fluorescent light bulb company, and he was involved in real estate. And there you can see him with a ceremonial bottle of champagne christening the new Breezeway lift on G in January of 1969, a new lift. 
Bevington's association with Monarch Country began in 1954 when he won a bid from the Forest Service to build a concession building called Monarch Crest on top of the pass. He soon built a road above Monarch Crest and put it in a glass observatory on top. And he conducted Jeep tours to the top. But when traffic became too heavy, Bevington built the Monarch Aerial Tramway, which went to 12,000 feet and opened in 1966. The gondola tram was the first in the state and had six gondola cars and ran 1,440 feet with a vertical rise of 700 feet. And there you can see it. The wires and poles have been replaced through the years, but the original gondolas remain. 13,000 people ride the tram every year, and they come from 100 different countries. The tram is open from May 15 to September 15, and the Monarch Crest business has 250,000 people visit the top of the pass every year. Ever the promoter, Elmo Bevington talked of finding a cave of gold in an old mine working near Garfield and generated a lot of publicity in the 1960s. From the 1950s to the 1980s, Bevington took tourists on tours every 30 minutes for $2 on an electric train, which ran 2,500 feet underground into the old Madonna mine. There it is. In 1980, the Environmental Protection Agency closed them down because of radon gas in the mine. Not dangerous to the customers who were only in there for a little while, but harmful to the workers who were in there for maybe eight hours a day. Elmo Bevington was the one man most instrumental in the success of the Monarch ski area. He cut new trails, put in ski lifts, improved lodging, and produced a lot of publicity for the area. When he retired, Elmo Bevington financed a book about himself entitled appropriately, The Man Who Amazed Himself, a real character to the very end. In 2021, the Monarch Ski Area is one of the gems in the Colorado ski industry. It is one of the oldest areas of the state and it's independent. It's a family area, very affordable compared to the large ski areas. It even has a very popular tubing hill, which young and gold alike together. Monarch is also free for anybody over 70, which I am, free skiing. In 2002, Bob Nichols led a group of 15 and bought the Monarch Ski Area. Since that time, the owners have poured millions of dollars into improvements involving buildings, new trails, expanded parking lot, and lifts. Even with the coronavirus shutting down the area on March the 14th, 2020, the Monarch Ski Area still had 176,000 skier visits during the winter of 2019 and 20. It averages 350 inches a year in snow, all natural, has some of the finest cat skiing in the West, and has a very bright future after humble beginnings many years ago. And there you get a good look at the, uh, the gun barrel, the original lift. If Elmo Bevington was one character at the Monarch Ski Area, Fred Hawking, known as Fearless Freddy, was another. Now there are some posters. They're tremendous, I've got them. All of the Monarch area. If Elmo Bevington was a character at the area, Fred Hawking, known as Fearless Freddy, was another. On the last day of the ski season in 1973, on a dare from mountain manager Jack Watkins, Hawking appeared at the top of the gun barrel the steepest run at Monarch with the main lodge and a thousand people down below. Watkins announced over the loudspeaker, attention ski area, Fred Hawking is going to attempt to shoot the gun barrel. A loud cheer went up as Hawking roared down the steep run. At an estimated speed of 50 miles an hour, Hawking stayed in a tuck 
cleared a creek near the bottom and slid to a stop in the parking lot. Watkins timed him in 11 seconds. The crowd went wild. And from that time, Hawking was known as Fearless Freddy. On January the 4th, 2006, Kent Strickland of Albuquerque began a 20 minute hike at the Monarch ski area to a steep and deep Mer Merkwood Bowl. He began walking uphill at 11 a.m. on a windy, cloudy day with limited visibility. One third of the way up, he came to a sign that said Merkwood. Mistaking it for the top of the bowl, Strickland skied off in the wrong direction west of the Continental Divide and into a drainage called No Name Bowl. With no backcountry ski experience, no GPS, no compass, Kent Strickland was in deep trouble. After breaking trail for hours and light beginning to fade, he packed down a circular track 15 yards wide. And every 15 minutes that night in the cold, he walked around the track to stay warm. Luckily, the next day was sunny, but when the second night came and went, Strickland was hungry and exhausted. After he went missing, his wife called the lodge where he had stayed and told that he had checked out. Then she called the Colorado State Patrol and they forwarded her message to the Chaffee County Sheriff. A county deputy then located Strickland's car in the Monarch parking lot. And only then, two days after his disappearance, did the search finally begin. Strickland's wife was cautioned to prepare for the recovery of a body and not a rescue. Then, miraculously, at one o'clock in the afternoon on the third day, Vern Kelso of Salida, looking for Strickland, found him seven and a half miles from Highway 50 while on his snowmobile and far away from the ski area. Strickland was dehydrated, suffered from hypothermia and had frostbitten toes, but he had survived three days in the cold and snow at high elevation, almost a miracle. Strickland and his wife were so moved by the actions and kindness of the Monarch area people that they moved to Salida in 2008 and they're still there today. Tragically, the man who saved Strickland, Vern Kelso, died in an avalanche while snowmobiling around Monarch Pass on March the 12th, 2010. Above the Monarch ski area near the Continental Divide are the remains of the famous Monarch Pass game drive, a prehistoric system of low boulder walls, hunting blinds, and ambush pits designed to lure big game to waiting hunters over 5,000 years ago. Bison, deer, elk, and mountain sheep were driven into these rock funnels by women and children where they were then killed by Native American hunters. The drives went on for thousands of years according to radiocarbon dating and occurred from about 3000 BC to 1800 AD. Today, around 3,000 vehicles go over Monarch Pass daily, a million a year, a far cry from the few horse or mule drawn wagons that made that crossing 140 years ago. Monarch country remains one of the most beautiful areas in Colorado and rich in mining, railroads, skiing, and toll road history, and complete with characters like Elmo Bevington and Fearless Freddy and Harry Miller and Frank Gimlet. It remains more a state of mind than just a beautiful area. And that takes care of the monarch country. And now, before we have any questions, we might have some, I give you the trivia question. And remember, the first one to answer will get a copy of the book around Monarch Pass. So everybody listen up, here we go, here's the question. I wanna know the name of the earliest and most famous run at the Monarch ski area. First one to answer gets the book. We're waiting for the answer. All right, answers are coming in fast. We've got Jack Carvel with Gun Barrel. Nell, how do they answer? Uh, is Gun Barrel correct? Who said it? Jack Carvel. Gun Barrel is correct. Okay. Okay, give, make sure we get his address. 
So no. Jack, I will shoot you an email. I have your email from your registration with Zoom. You have won Dwayne's Monarch Country book. I will shoot you an email, ask him for your mailing address, and I will give that over to Dwayne uh, so he can mail out that book to you. Now, is there, are there any questions that anybody has? And you can go to the chat. I mean, I'd love to see where you're from and who you are. But if there are any questions, I'll, I'll hope to answer. Uh, so thank all of you for being on board. We had almost 200 people on board tonight. Awesome. We did have a lot of people asking if uh, this is getting recorded and shared later, and it is. I have recorded this session, and we'll have it at crestabutemuseum.com. And I'm pretty sure that Monarch is also going to be sharing this video and have it available as well. Thank All you, Mel. Right. Uh, Karen commented pretty early. Uh, she was a student teaching at Gunnison High School at the time of the tragic accident. Oh, wow. Yeah. Wow. And then Scott Piles added, in mid-1800s, there was a toll road on the road heading out of Poncha Springs to the south between Cleveland Mountain and Poncha Mountain. Do you have any information on it? My great grandmother's parents ran the toll station, but I can't find the location. Yeah, I can, Scott. Now, I don't know the exact location, but Otto Mears Toll Road ran from Sawatch over Poncha Pass and then right through Poncha Springs heading for California Gulch. And when he was building his toll road, he was visited by the ex governor of Colorado, William Gilpin, who said, Let me give you some advice, son. When you build your toll roads, build them at less than a 4% grade because the railroads are coming, Sonny. And when they come in, they'll buy your toll road because they can go over a 4% grade. And Otto Mears was able to sell his toll road both over Poncha Pass and over Marshall Pass. Any other questions or any other chats? Yes. Uh, next question is how Bill asks, how can we get more information on Dr. Vandenbush's Thursday night programs in the Crested Butte area? Well, I'll let Nell answer that. Okay, so you can go to CrestedButeMuseum.com and you'll be able to register for his history of the Crested Butte area. Every Thursday night through the beginning of April, there's 12 sessions. They are free thanks to uh, some great sponsors. We get started tomorrow night, same time. And one of them, uh, ladies and gentlemen, will be uh, early day skiing. So each one's going to be a different episode, and they last about uh, 40 to 45 minutes. And as Nell said, they're free. Just hit the link, crestedbeardmuseum.com. Uh, Any other questions or chat? Uh, Alex Webster added, Ray Berry died in 1964. It was his two sons, William and Jerry, who sold Monarch Ski Area to Bevington. Yeah, thank you for that. Yep, the Berry family was very much involved. Yeah, there's a question from Daniel. Duane, do you still ski? Uh, yes, I do. And I've skied at Monarch 12 times already this year. My favorite run, well, a number of favorite runs, but my absolute favorite run is, uh, get this, high anxiety when it's got powder. Uh, we've got a question from Jay. Is the background used behind Dwayne from Crested Butte? Yeah, that is. I, I had somebody do it for me. I'm not technologically gifted. That was bought from J.C. Leacock a number of years ago, and that is Cre the main street of Crested Butte, Elk Avenue at night about uh, 10 years ago. It beats the hell out of the curtains that I had below with some uh, lotion on this on the windowsill. <laughs> uh, David asks, where were the railroad tracks up to Monarch from Salida? Were they on the grade where US 50 is now? No, they weren't. They did cross the grade. But if you're uh, if you're coming up from Salida, they're primarily on the left side of the highway. But then when you got towards Garfield, the railroad tracks crossed. And I remember, and I was too dumb to take pictures. I should have, but I didn't know enough then. But the cars would have to wait while the railroad crossed Highway 50. So primarily on the left of the south side. Uh, Jack asks, and this might be something uh, that- <laughs> Scott uh, says, just to be clear, I feel the tension of your lecture. <laughs> Any other questions? 
Uh, yes, we've got a question that actually Alex Webster might be able to answer, being the granddaughter of uh, Ray Barry. Jack asks, is Tom Barry any relation? His name is engraved on my front porch. Hmm. Granddaughter's going to have to answer that because I don't know. <laughs> All right. Uh, let's see, Bill added, Monarch was great. Ski for $2.50 with a student card and three two beer was 15 cents a glass. <laughs> that's that's great. Yeah, you know, when I got up here, I, I got a pass at Crested Butte and the pass for the year was $60. The skis I had when I skied at Monarch on that Thanksgiving day, I bought head standards, head poles, double lace boots, all used 80 bucks. And I was so stupid that in the uh, inferno, I had to watch people so I could figure out how to lace up the double lace boots. It took me three hours to get down. All right, Drew Frey asks, I'd love, I'd love to learn more about the history of the Jackson Hotel in Poncha Springs, if you can share. Yeah, you know, the uh, I've got some more notes on the Jackson Hotel. That was built very early in, I, I think, 1878. It is now privately owned, and I'll have to get back to you on that because I don't have a whole lot of information on it. I do have some, though, but I knew it was built in 1878, and it's one of the great old hotels that we have, now privately owned. All right, let's see. One last comment from Joe Myers. Kent Strickland absolutely tore it up in today's powder up at Monarch with him today. He's still skiing. You know, I I had classes all day today and my good friend Tom Prather ran up, went up there and he said there were four inches and it was just killing me. I told him I don't want to hear it. If I had not had classes, I'd be I'd have been up there. I love skiing the powder at Monarch. And my favorite run coming down as you come into the area is freeway. Catherine Ambrose asks, can you tell us about the town of Chavano? Chavano, of course, was located north of uh, Poncha Springs. And I can't tell you a whole lot about it, but I can tell you that Robert Brown's ghost town in the rock, ghost towns of the Rockies, and uh, then another one by Perry Eberhardt, E-B-E-R, will tell you a lot about Chavano. It didn't last very long. It was a silver town. All right. Any last questions before we wrap up tonight? Please post them in there. Um, Jay notes, getting the extra snow is great to hear. We were there a couple of weeks ago, but quite a few bear spots. Still fun, though. Yes, we all got snow we really needed this week. Yeah, Monarch is one of my favorite areas. I want to thank everybody for being on today. It was great to see Jim Balfance and Scott Piles and some of the other people that I uh, associated with back in the old days. I'll tell Scott and Jim this. I saw a video on the uh, internet the other day of a guy skiing at Kitzbühel, the downhill, not in the race, but he had a camera. And I've walked it, and that is the uh, greatest and the most famous downhill in the world. And they say, and Buddy Werner is the only American ever to win that all the way. Darren Rawls won it one year, but they didn't have a lot of snow and he went halfway. And they used to say, when you win the downhill at Kitzbühel, you'll never again buy any drinks or any food in all of Austria. Thank you, everybody. We've got one last question that snuck in from you bet. Me. Do you have information on Chalk Creek? On what? What is the name of the creek? Chalk, as in oh Chalk Creek. Yeah. Oh, of course, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know Chalk Chalk Creek is very famous because that's where the Denver South Park Railroad came up and ran to the Alpine Tunnel, and that's where the ghost towns of Romley, St. Elmo, Forest Hill, and Alpine are all located on Chalk Creek on the east side. So yeah, there's a lot of great information. And if you go to Romley, Hancock, or St. Elmo, you'll find a whole bunch of information on Chalk Creek. That's where the South Park came up to the tunnel. All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. Jack Carville, I will be in touch with you about your trivia prize. Congratulations. 
just a reminder that we do have Dwayne's uh, beginning uh, with Dwayne series starting tomorrow at seven o'clock. You can register at CrestedButteMuseum.com. And if you do get up and come skiing at Monarch, come by the Crested Butte Museum and check out our updated snow sports exhibit that Dwayne helped us do. Now, if you would get the address of uh, Ms. Webster, she wants a picture of Ray Berry, and I'll be happy to send that. If you can get her address for me, uh, I will, or give her my email address, I'd appreciate that. That's Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Over and out. Thank you, Nell. Thank you, Dwayne.